We're so glad you're joining with us for worship, whether that be online or here in person. Man, it's so, good. It's so fun to worship with you guys. I don't know if you feel the same way. Um, I do. I do. Um, one of the aspects I love about it is a familial aspect. Um, you know, like at a family party when someone breaks out karaoke and everybody sings like Sweet Caroline and it's all bad, something's good, you know what I mean? And you mess up and um, it's fun. There's a familial aspect to it. Well, it's a lot of how I like to look at this time here. Um, this is not a professional team with a non-professional church. We are real people, real people that are saved by God because we were sinners. Um, God has made this family here in the Norwich neighborhood and I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful. And here's what I wanna remind you. This is, um, this is out of Luke chapter 19. This is talking, um, this is the verse we share usually on Palm Sunday. It says this, we came near the place um, where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, he meaning Jesus, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus said, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You know, the funny thing is, is they were celebrating him um, for something they didn't know. They were celebrating him for the bread that he would give them and the people that he would heal. And little did they know that he was literally on his way to do the biggest miracle of them all, which is to save them from death to have them not no longer suffer the wrath of God because he would do that on our behalf. So here's what I would encourage you. We know that. They didn't then. We know that now. We know that now. And yet we still say those same words. So that's what I would encourage you. Don't be silent when we're singing. Why? One, because this is not American Idol. No one's judging you. Two, um, because together as one voice, I think it's really beautiful that we get to celebrate God together. And that's what I would encourage you. It's not about you. It's not about us. It's not about my dad. It's not about the name of new life. It's about the name of Jesus. That's why we sing these songs. That's why we raise our voice. Even if it's not professional, who cares? Who cares? I want to be the people that are loud at praising God and not be the ones that the stones have to replace my voice. I don't want that for you. So let's raise our voice. Whether it's pretty, whether you think it's not, uh, no matter who's around you, let's worship. Let's worship and raise our voice in the same way that they did, but us knowing what he's done for us. Amen? All right, let's pray real quick when we get into it. God, thank you so much that you would die for us. Thank you so much that um, we didn't even know that we needed it and that you'd still give it to us. It's something that we never asked for, that we never sought you about, and yet you gave it to us because you know we needed it. Thank you that you um, have always been faithful to us, even in our times of unfaithfulness to you. So God, I'm praying that we wouldn't be silent here. I pray that we would engage in worshiping you, that it would be okay to sing, that it'd be okay to lift our hands, that it'd be okay to be loud um, because we know what you've done for us. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be a church where the rocks sing louder than our, than our worship. I don't want that. Lord, I know the rocks and the trees and all creation worships you, Lord. But I want to be a part of that. And I want our church to be a part of that. So would you help us to become more of a worshipful church that doesn't just sing on Sundays but sings through the rest of the week. But for right now, I'm asking that you would help us to worship you. Non-distracted, totally focused on you. Lord, we love you. We want to thank you for the cross. Thank you for the work that was done there because without it, we wouldn't be here. Yeah, and I pray that this would be one voice, a giant offering unto you um, that you'd be pleased with all because of what Jesus has done. So Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Just 
Reading from Psalm 66, it says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Please bow your heads and pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, what a joy and honor it is to be in your house this morning to worship the King of Kings, the creator of all things. Together, Lord, we praise you as the holy and righteous one. There is none like you. No idol we could ever form 
could ever come close to the love and peace that you provide. Even in this season of struggle, Lord, we see the work of your hand. We see people being saved. We see lives transformed. We see relationships restored. May Christ be magnified in each and every one of us here. We ask this in his mighty name. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon and welcome to New Life Community Church. My name is George Peters. These are my daughters, Liliana and Jasmine, and together we would like to welcome you here today. Uh, if you're here worshiping with us, please take a moment to turn around, wave to those that are around you, and uh, welcome everyone here. Please, no hugs. But, uh, and to you that are uh, joining us from home, welcome. We love you, we miss you, and we can't wait for you to join us here again. And thank you so much for the worship team. That was just amazing. I love these, um, these songs and these, these, these songs of praise. Uh, it, it's just an amazing, amazing um, aspect to think about that, you know, Jesus said himself, that if, if we stopped, even the rocks would cry out. And, and you just look around you. I mean, we're coming out of this deep freeze. We're, we're, we're seeing uh, trees. We're seeing grass on the ground again. And we see the work of creation. And it's just such an amazing thing. So um, wonderful, wonderful time this morning. Um, so getting back to it, welcome. And if this is your first time uh, joining us today, we want to give you a very special warm welcome. Um, and uh, with that, if we do have a welcome card that we would ask you to fill out um, since we're, you know, going through this thing with COVID. We're not going to hand anything out, but you can go on our website or our app and you can fill out our digital welcome card. That's just a way for us to get in contact with you and to get to know you and, and also to be able to provide you with all that's going on here at New Life. And for filling that out, we'd like to give you a free gift. Um, so please, if, you, if you're new, uh, please take the, a moment to fill that out. If you have been coming for some time and you've changed your phone number, changed your email address, or maybe you've moved, you could also use that form to update us with that information. Um, by way of announcements, today we are going, going to be celebrating communion together. So as you entered, you should have received the elements. And if you haven't, please raise your hand and we'll make sure that one of the ushers get that to you. If you're joining us from home, please take a moment during service to prepare some elements for that. And then uh, finally, we will be having another uh, prayer and worship meeting, not this Monday, but next Monday. So that's going to be on the 8th. Um, so please um, join us, uh, plan on joining us either here online, here or online. Um, and it's just, it's just a powerful time. You know, I mean, we, 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 we all know prayer is a very integral part of our faith, right? Um, and we should be doing that on our own. But it's also a great time to be able to come together collectively and pray together. Uh, over over certain things. So um, moving on, uh, we're going to continue our worship with giving. So uh, as you know, we will not be passing the offering baskets, but if you are going to be providing a, uh, a tithe or offering, uh, you can fill out one of the envelopes that are in the pews, and then you could return that uh, to one of the ushers who will be standing at the back after service, or you could put it in the kiosk that's out in the foyer. Um, a great way of giving also is, is uh, online. It's uh, my preferred way of doing it. Um, and if you would like to begin doing that, you could type L NL Norridge, one word, to 77977. Um, or you could just visit our website and, and click on the Give link. Um, and if you're the type of person that says, I, I want to write my check, I, this is how I've been doing it for years, you could do that too. Um, and you could, obviously, if you're here, you can turn it in here if you're home. Uh, just make it payable to New Life Community Church and write Norwich in the memo. And then you can mail that to, to our main office and we'll provide the address and the link. So let's continue our worship and prayer over this offering. Um, Father God, we uh, come to you this morning and, and, and just, just thanksgiving, God. Uh, uh, just the spirit of thanksgiving and, and just how much you've blessed us throughout this time. We've, we've had some incredible struggles over the last year, Lord God. And... Um, we're, we're just so thankful in, in how you've provided for us and how you've kept us afloat, Lord God. Um, and, and Lord, we just uh, we want to lift this offering up to you today um, and ask, Father God, that uh, it will do mighty, mighty things. Uh, we, we've seen the fruit in this neighborhood. We've seen the fruit in our own midst, Father God. And uh, we know, Lord, that you are doing a work, that you're going to continue to do a work, Father God. So we just ask, Lord God, that these these uh, offerings are, are going to be used in a mighty way uh, to glorify you. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I'd like to introduce our very own Pastor Tom Fitzmorris. Great job. 
How's everybody doing? <laughs> Nobody likes a suck up except me. <laughs> That's why I love you. You're number one. Um, all right. Well, let's um, let's open up our Bibles to the Book of James. First of all, I want to say thank you to the worship team. Thank you for the. Uh, the ushers and, and the tech team, everybody always does such a great job. There's such ownership. Uh, thank you to Kent last week who did such an excellent job with the text. You know, it's, uh, it's a reminder to us that uh, this isn't about, this is about one person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And if it's about anyone else, then it's not the church for you to be in. I'm going to say that right now. It's not. If it's about anything other than that, someone's directing you toward that, don't go to that church no more. Don't go there. All right, well, let's open up our Bibles to the book of James, chapter, uh, chapter 2, and we'll, we'll start at verse 14. But let's pray together first. Father God, I'm grateful, grateful for this book uh, that I did not like for so many years. I'm grateful that you are so faithful to say things over and over to us when sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, I've heard it a million times from you and I just blocked it out. And you, you're, you're, you're relentless. You keep telling me over and over in a 30 million different ways until I catch it. And I'm grateful for that. So what I'm asking you to do is pour your grace upon us again. Transform us today by the renewing of our mind. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay. Starting at verse 14, chapter 2 of the book of James. Um, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but they have no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose there's a brother or sister without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, well fed but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if by itself, and not accompanied by action, it's dead. But someone will say to me, you have faith, I have deeds. I Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. That's something for you to underline right there, if that's your Bible. You believe there's one God. Great. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. And one of the things I, I want to stop there for just a second. You know, one of the things that's crazy about the demons, every time you see demons in the New Testament, when they hear Jesus talk, they drop everything and run to his feet and throw down. They throw themselves right at his feet. Oh, they stop things, and they run to him instead of running. And we, who are made in his image, will disrespect God to his face over and over. How has that happened? How I think I understand a little bit. We're, we're, we're the object of his love, and the demons are not. See, God, God won't restrain his hand from them, but he will restrain his hand from us, just like our kids. Keep going. Um, was not your father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. The scripture was fulfilled, uh, and the scripture was fulfilled that said Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, and uh, by what they do, and not by faith alone. This causes controversy. This is a huge controversial subject. This is a controversial verse, and we're going to get controversial today. Okay. In the same way, was not Rahab, Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what, he, what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. This is God's word. A powerful scripture. Powerful scripture. Um, James is indeed a brass tacks kind of guy. Um, the word that the issue we're talking about today is is the 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 issue or the doctrine of what we call justification. You know, I remember reading this a long time ago that the church today has moved away from theological uh, pr profound words. Like you can't use the word exp expiation or um, 
we can't use the word justification or we can't use the word sanctification. We can't use all these words because it kind of goes over people's heads and they miss what it means and then they tune out. And what I'd like to say is um, I'm sad that that happened and that has happened in the church because really if, if we become a people who um, kind of are weakly taught, we will have a weak reaction or response to our Christianity. A uninformed Christian is an endangered Christian. It's endangered. And one of the things that we kind of, I don't want to say pride ourselves on, but we really make an effort to do here is to, to get to the meat and bones of the scripture and to teach more than just surface level Christianity. Because you can kind of like hover around that, you know, one to two inch uh, depth and kind of make everybody happy. And then, you know, we kind of walk out on a high note. We kind of float out on clouds. But the reality is, is if you have a shallow experience, it's almost like eating junk food all the time. Yes, you will survive, but there's consequences after 10 years of it. Agreed? You know, mo mo most people after eating that wind up diabetic. They have problems with their... Their organs and their bodies, they've gained too much weight. Their muscle mass has gone. See, one of the things is we have to live a vigorous life because you know why? This is not a dash. This is a marathon. And sadly, not everybody gets to the end of the course. That makes me really sad sometimes. That makes me really sad. Keeps me up at night. Who's going to be the one that drops off? So the word is justification. The issue is justification. It is the single most important doctrine of the Christian faith. It answers for us the question, how are we saved and why are we saved? Someone came up to you on the street and said, is there a heaven? And you said, yes. And they said, are you going there? What would you say? Most of us would say, yes, I'm going to heaven. Why? Why would you go to heaven? What if they said, why are you going to heaven? Most of us would say, we have faith. But what if they said to you, well, I have faith too. I have faith, in, I have faith in the fact that there's a God. Why does your faith save you and my faith doesn't? Well, I have faith in Jesus. Well, why is it your faith is any different than my faith? I have faith in Ra, the, the sun god. I mean, why does faith in Jesus save you, but this one kind of leaves you off alienated from God? Do you have an answer for that? Do you have an answer for that? Because you need to have an answer. Peter tells us we have to have a gentle response for those who are going to ask us if they ask us on the road of life. And you know what? You're not going to learn that from weak or, or, or shallow messages or non-study of the word. You're just not going to. You're going to go to experience and feeling, which is the same as every other person on earth. Whether they believe in their job, their family, the God of the universe, or some other God, everyone feels like they're saved. So feelings don't work. It's never a reason. Well, I just know that I know that I know. You know what I've learned about myself is I can't trust my feelings. Because my feelings have led me astray more than a couple times. So I have learned to stand upon what is verifiable right here. I've learned how to do that. If we learn how we're saved and why we're saved, I believe that it will give us a direct line as what we're saved for. What's the point of our salvation? James is talking about what's the point of your salvation? Don't tell me you believe. Don't uh, 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 make professions and hashtags and t-shirts and all these different things about how Jesus is number one. Tell me what the point of your salvation is. I want to see it. I want to put my hands on it. Because ultimately he knew the truth. That this profound thing will transform the world. Transforms the world. And that goes way beyond just feelings. Feelings come and go, but this stays the test of time. All right. The word justification as defined in Latin or Koine Greek have very subtle but consequential differences. All right. 
The reason we're not in a Catholic church, Roman Catholicism, which was the only church of Christianity, is based on this word and this word only. If we were to find justification in the Latin, it would be this, that Jesus acted righteously toward us. So what does that mean in our everyday life if we follow that doctrine? That we must partake in his life every day. And if we don't, then we are in danger of losing our salvation. Do you know that partaking in his life is partaking in, and I'm not, I'm not demeaning, I'm not insulting the Catholic Church, I'm just teaching you the truth between the Protestant and reformed understanding of the gospel and Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism used to teach me when I was there that I had to take communion at least once a week. If you don't take that, you're in trouble. I used to have to confess before a priest at least once a month. When my father was a kid, they used to have to do it every day. You used to have to take communion every day. There's, there's sacraments that we have to partake in so that we can continue in Christ. And then we have to keep our records clean. That means there's venial sins, which are small sins, and they're consequential, but not quite as consequential. And then there's moral sins. Did you know that in the catechism of the Catholic Church, if I commit adultery, walk out of my girlfriend's bedroom, and get struck by lightning and die, I don't care if I followed the Lord for 47 years, I immediately go to hell that's 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 the catechism i'm just telling you but the koine greek teaches me something subtly but profoundly different it means this that we are declared righteous because of the actions of another okay When Martin Luther, who was a monk, and I'm telling you, he was the best monk who ever was a monk. He really felt the weight of sin. He felt the glory of God. So much so that when he would confess, he'd walk out, stub his toe, and he'd feel like cursing. And he'd walk right back in. So he couldn't get more than five feet from the confessional booth. Finally, the brothers who would listen to his confession, they'd be like, come on, man. You're killing me with this stuff. Stop being so overdramatic. But you know what? Martin Luther had a sense of the holiness of God, which is foreign to humanity. It's foreign to us. Unless God reveals it to us, we will have a tendency to overlook it or treat it with contempt. I assure you the holiness of God is not something we want to hold lightly in our hands. It is a matter of death and life. So when he went away to Rome, for the first time in his life, he started to read the Greek manuscripts. And as he was reading through the book of Romans, he got to Romans chapter 5. And as he read the truth in Romans chapter 5, he said these words, Simul ustis et peccator, which means by Whose righteousness we are saved. Whose righteousness? He knew he was righteous, not because he took communion in the morning, confessed in the afternoon, took communion at night, and confessed in the evening, said his prayers, and did all those good, noble acts. He knew he was right in an instant because Jesus lived the righteous life he could never have lived in his stead. And I have been called to believe my faith as a reformed believer. I don't even believe that's mine. I didn't wake up one day and say, hey man, I think I'm just going to believe in Jesus. Because I'm going to be honest with you, my old way of life was a lot easier than this way. So I don't believe anyone wakes up and just says, hey man, I'm going to follow Jesus today. Because once they get to know the real Jesus, they think twice about it. They're like, this is kind of tough. There's demands here. You know what? I really don't own my life. You know, I don't know about you, but that sometimes rubs me the wrong way. So he said, Simulusis et Pector, he understood in the very first time in his life what he was saved by. He was saved by the actions of another. And what he said is this Bible that would cause him to sweat bullets when he read. Because he'd be like, I know what God is telling me is my due, and I don't ever do it. I'm in big trouble here. 
And I'll just go to another page. Oh, man, I'm in trouble here, too. And I'll go to another one. Oh, I'm in trouble here, too. He said when he read this, the entire Bible was opened up to him. He was allowed to walk through the door that Jesus threw open into the throne room of the glory of God. And now, from this, we have Protestant Christianity, which is different than Roman Catholicism. It's different. It would be easy for us to believe that James is encouraging us to abandon theology and doctrine and focus on practical experience. That happened in the 1700s with a guy named Frederick Schleiermacher. He was a theologian who said, listen, doctrine divides. Don't go to doctrine. It just makes Christians against Christians. He goes, let's go to experience. But the problem is, your experience and my experience are going to be different. You know why? You and me are different. We grew up in different homes, in different neighborhoods. We have different families. We have different ways of looking at things. So what I believe is what a man named Sinclair Ferguson, I was listening to him today, he's a great teacher. I was listening to him this week. And he was talking about doctrine and the importance of it. He said this. He said that he believed that our theology and doctrine should impact and define our experience. You know, I'm not always convinced when someone said, God told me. You know why? I've heard many people say those words, and then when I hear what comes after, I'm like, God didn't tell you that. Maybe you ate a burrito at 930, and that's coming back at you, or you ate a pepperoni pizza from the frozen food aisle, but that ain't God. At least it ain't this God. It ain't this God. Because God doesn't say one thing to you and another thing to you. And he doesn't say one thing on Monday and then another thing on Tuesday. God is the same from forever. He doesn't ever change. One of his attributes is immutability. That means I don't change. You change. You waver. Not me. That's why anyone who finds themselves clinging to him has a solid rock to be attached to. This is important stuff. It's important stuff. So I want to say this as we go into the scripture. Our theology and our doctrine will always drive our practice and define our experience. Okay? So what I believe is, as, as up to this point, I believe James is telling you and I that salvation is conversion. There's a change, a spiritual change supernatural change that has happened. We have changed in character, form, and function. We have changed in attitude and emotion or viewpoint from one of indifference, disbelief, or antagonism to acceptance, faith, and enthusiastic support. This guy, Sinclair Ferguson, was asked the question, how do you know when you're saved? He said, when salvation comes to life in your life. I can profess whatever I want. Unless it grows what God determined for it to grow. Now I want you to understand. It's not going to grow the same for everybody. In the same time. In the same way. And in the same amount. We're all different. We get that. But it's going to grow. And if there's no growth. Then that seed ain't his seed. It's just not. It's not. And James is letting us know that. One of the things that salvation converts is human desire. Listen to what Augustine of Hippo said. Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until we find rest in thee. Do you know the truth of the matter is I know that to be a fundamental truth in my life, but if you would have talked to me 23 years ago, I would have said, you are out of your cotton pick in mind. You're nuts. There's no way that's true for me. But I know it's the truth for me now. It's such a profound and, and, and bedrock truth for me that it causes all other desires to be measured by that truth. It's literally like the one in the middle that weighs everything else. So human desire is converted in those who are converted. I want you to know something about human desire. Human desire is the most potent force known to man. 
It has been the cause of more efforts given toward human advancement than anything else in all of history. Desire empowered Lewis and Clark and 45 men to take 28 months to travel into the unknown wilderness trying to find a passage to connect the eastern United States to the western United States. Problem is, they didn't even know if there was a route. So they literally could have been walking to their death. But it was desire that caused them to do this. It was human desire to protect and preserve his home country of Carthage that enabled and empowered the great Carthaginian general Hannibal to move 16 days, an army of 30,000 men, 37 elephants, and 15,000 horses over the Alps and attack Rome during the Punic Wars. Quite an undertaking. Quite an undertaking. It's human, in, in, it's human desire that empowers men and women to become doctors. Do you know it takes an average of 40,000 hours to become a medical doctor? That's equivalent to 20 years of hard labor. And you know what? I, I know that they make a fairly decent living, but I don't think everyone that's a doctor is loaded. So I don't think money is the issue there. Something else is at play. It takes an average of 3,600 hours of training over four years to compete in the Olympics for a possible chance to win a gold, silver, or bronze medal. Michael Phelps estimated that he swam over 80,000 meters in four years. Do you know what that is? That's equivalent to 49.71 miles. That's swimming from O'Hare Airport to the outskirts of Rockford. It was human desire that caused him to eat between 8,000 and 10,000 calories a day. Do you understand that that means he ate every waking moment he was awake? Every waking moment. He'd swim and he'd eat. Why? So that he could compete. He said that he stretched an, an, hour, uh, an average of two hours every day for four years because of desire. Desire. These individuals endured countless hours of maximum stress to achieve something that the world would most likely applause and would outlive them. That's man's attempt to grab hold of eternity. We build businesses, we get married, we build homes so that we can outlive ourselves. It's something woven into us. Can't get away from it. Do you know why we have a society of people, youth, that are so lost? Because they don't believe there's an eternity anymore. They've got nothing. So they live for experience. And you know what they learn quickly? Living for experience sucks. I know you can't say that. But it does. It does. So there's a whole group of people who are lost because, hey, you know, one of the things that time and history proves again and again that people fade away into insignificance. Go and ask somebody who Hannibal was. Go just walk down the street ask him. Ask him who Julius Caesar was. Ask him who Ronald Reagan was. Ask him... <laughs> some of the most famous people in the world, you'll ask them, like, I don't know, does he live next to you? They don't know. You know why? Because that's what history will do. It was Jesus Christ's desire to honor his father that prompted him to leave his supreme seat of honor and praise. To enter, now get this, I wrote this down and every time, every time I would go over it, it still blows my mind. He did this to enter into the time, space, and matter that he himself speaks into existence and holds together by his powerful word. How that happened, I have no idea. I have no idea how that happened. But that's what happened. You know how I know? John chapter 1. It was love and desire that empowered his willingness to enter into the world in the most vulnerable and unesteemed place. It was desire and love that caused him to take upon himself our reality. It was love and desire that caused him to live a perfect life of worship in our place and to suffer the penalty for our deliberate acts of rebellion and apathy toward God. Why did he do this? 
to give his father a people that would seek to strive to worship God in spirit and in truth. See, one of the things that you can do when you're reading the whole Bible, you'll see how it neatly weaves together. It's not like you can read one book and go, oh, that doesn't belong here. That doesn't seem to fit because it all fits and it all tells one story. You know what that story is? Christ be magnified. Christ be magnified in me. That's what it tells. It's what he said. Not my words. It's not my, it's not my take on the whole matter. He said it. He said, Why do you study the word, you Pharisees? You teachers of the Lord? You're trying to do it so that you could somehow say, I've studied it. Now I can grab heaven. He goes, Don't you know it testifies of me over and over and over? But you refuse to come to me. How blind are you when you're reading the book about the person and the person standing in front of you and you can't see him because you refuse to? Oh, wow, you are blind. What does worshiping in spirit and in truth mean? Well, first, let's look at the word breathe. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, I'm going to read it for you. It says, then the Lord God formed, it, formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now listen, it was the breath of God that transformed man from raw material. You know what we're made of? The same thing everyone else is made of. You know, I was watching that show, I don't know if you remember it on Channel 11, it was about the genome, and they were talking about how many, how many things they've learned about the gene. Do you know what separates us from, from one another? One one thousandth of a percent. Look at how different you look from everybody else. Only one one thousandth of a percent changes you from anyone else. You know, we're made from the same stuff that the dirt is made from. It's not like you used other material. We're made from the ground. Just like the mountains. That's why Christ said, if you don't do it, they will. At least they know who they are. That's kind of what he's saying. See, Jesus is, you know, he, he just can't get around him. Just can't get around him. So he breathed into this raw material, making us living beings. Anyone can see that there is a difference between what science would show us to be as cavemen and what we are today. Now, they would say, well, it's a series of evolution. I do not believe that is true. I believe there was cavemen, and then God said, we're done with that. I have the raw material. Now I'm going to breathe life and create a people for myself. We didn't get where we're at because we just happened over 10 million years. My kitchen's destroyed because we're doing it over. I assure you, if the guy doesn't come back for three months, my kitchen's still going to be destroyed. Time plus nothing will do nothing in your life. But if they want to believe that fairy tale and it's easier for them, it's what they got. It's okay. But I, for one, I couldn't live like that. It's too, too foolish for me to believe. It's too much of a fairy tale. So this is what I believe it is to be born again. That's the first life, and now because of Christ leading us to Christ, this is the second life. God breathes his life-giving spirit into us, animating us to a life inclined toward a determined direction of honoring God in every and all circumstance. You know, one of the things I don't like to do is to teach you the peccadillos of Christianity. you got to pray. You do have to pray. You have to give and live generously. You do have to give. But I don't give you the do this, do that, do this, do that. You know why? Because we all have an inclination, a broken wheel that will do those things and then claim credit for it. Do you remember Jesus? Are there a lot of people going to be in heaven? And he says, no, I tell you the truth, no. He goes, I can see it now. People are going to come to me in the end. They're going to go, hey, Jesus, you remember me? I did all this stuff. I taught in your name. I expelled demons. I gave to the poor. He's going to go, no. I don't know who you did that for, but not for me. Depart from me. Depart from me, you who do evil acts into the darkness. Evil acts? Those look like holy, righteous things. They're not holy and righteous when I'm doing them to prove how much he owes me. 
You know what that becomes then? It becomes another weapon for me to use against him. Or another stick to keep him at arm's distance. See, Jesus doesn't want arm's distance. He wants to be in my grill. He wants to be in me. He wants to fight in the trenches of my heart. Because for a guy like me, it's a fight. My flesh is no joke. But one thing I've learned, his spirit is way more powerful. James understood through divine revelation and experiential revelation that something occurred in his own life that was so powerfully transformational. No human or natural explanation was applicable or reasonable. One of the greatest things that we can have carry with us is our testimony. When did you, when did Christ interrupt your life? When did he come to you on the road? You know, I love when they say, I've been a Christian all my whole life. Really? You, know, you might have been going to church your whole life, but I assure you, you ain't been a Christian your whole life. Because you're born again into Christianity. You don't seek God. You are converted into seeking God. You are converted into repentance. That's the truth. That's why Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10 says, For we have nothing to boast about in the presence of God. It's not like I get to go to Jack, man. Didn't we make that? Look at, them, look at them idiots over there sweating to death in hell. Man, we made great choices. Nobody gets to make that claim. Do you know why? Because it's his, no, it ain't him. It's his salvation. And he gives it to me. Now we're going to get into the meat of the matter. Let's look at the other part of the worship. Jesus said this. He said, um, he said that the Father is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. The other part is truth. In John chapter 14, listen to what he says. Jesus answered his disciples. His disciples now, people who followed him for about three years. I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father apart from me. They still thought Jesus was going to be the one who was going to take them by the hand and bring them to where they needed to go. He goes, man, you don't get it. You've been with me for three years. I'm not taking you anywhere. I'm where you're supposed to be. I want you to understand the depth of this statement because it's profound. Let's break it down. Jesus is saying, I'm the point of life itself. When you ask yourself, why am I here? You're here for Christ. You're here for Christ. Anytime I take anything else and attach it to any other meaning, it becomes a curse for me. I get married so that I can be fulfilled. Then I place heavy weights on my wife she'll never be able to do, and I make myself set up for disillusionment. But if I say I'm getting married so Christ can be glorified... Well, it can happen. Well, it costs. It costs, but it happens. If I go to work and I say, I'm going to do it so that I can be rich, we may get that richness and find, man, it still didn't fill that void. But if I work for Christ for him to be glorified, it doesn't matter what my boss does. You know what? It's up to Christ, the one that I did it for, for him to judge me and bring me where he wants. And trust me, if he wants you to raise up the ladder, you will. And if he thinks it's dangerous for you, you won't. So he's saying clearly, I'm the point of life. See, you can't teach that. There's no five steps to that. See, you know what? The only way you get to that conclusion is if you stand in the presence of his glory where all that light and magnificence burns down upon you and it crumples you to the ground. But when you think you can't breathe anymore, that's when he lifts you up. That's when you find you have been hardened like steel. That's when you realize, wait a minute, I came in like this, but now somehow I feel like I'm eternal. That's why Christians can undergo things that most can't. J 
Jesus is saying the only path to eternal joy with God the Father is me. I want you to notice he's not saying, I will teach you how to get to the path or what it looks like. He's not saying, I'll show you what you must do to get there or who you have to pay to get there. He's not saying, I will be an example for you when you get on the road. He's not saying, I'm going to open the door for you to walk through. He's saying this, even though I'm your teacher and I am your example and I am the demonstrator of what it is to worship, my main purpose for being here is to live so that you could be saved. My life will be your salvation. That makes me cry. That makes me want to sing till my voice is raw. Because what a magnificent gift this is. What a magnificent gift this is. It prompts something. It gives birth to something. Paul fiercely guarded this truth in his ministry to the Corinthians. He said, I was determined with fear fear and trembling, that when I came in your presence, I would live, breathe, eat, and sleep Christ dying for the forgiveness of sins while I was with you. Why? Because he didn't want to cloud up the point of life. He's like, I'm not going to teach you all those other things. I'm going to teach you about Christ, bring you into the glory of God, into his presence. You're going to bask, and the Holy Spirit's going to teach you in a very experiential sort of way. The classroom of Christianity is in the classroom of our homes. It's in the classroom of our work. It's in the classroom of our car and in traffic. That's where the Holy Spirit does the transforming teaching. When he says, you were in my presence this weekend. How are you supposed to respond to that insult? Oh, golly, that's a tough one. To the Galatians... Paul says to them, why have you abandoned the truth that has done so much in your life? That's my favorite book. You know what? I didn't do it because I was a bastion of self-discipline. I'm anything but that. I'm not. I am where I am because he has sometimes dragged me. He has fundamentally changed my reason for getting up. And no matter how I fight against it or what reasons I have for going in the other direction, I can't stay long. Why? Because I'm a great guy? I ain't that great. No, I've been converted. Have you? I know you have. I know you have. But now it's time for that conversion to blossom. He says, you came here under the power of Christ. Now you think you can earn God's favor by working for it. Favorite line in the New Testament, you foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Finally, to the Colossians, Paul states unapologetically, you want to know about truth? You want to know about ultimate truth? Here it is. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the preeminent one over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and things upon earth, whether they're visible or invisible, whether they're thrones, powers, rulers, or authority. All things have been created through him and for him. For he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Everything was created to glorify God's righteousness through his mercy and his unwavering Love, or it was created to be judged and damned. It's an inconvenient truth. Everything, everything in all creation from the beginning of time, everything that was created, is created, was already set in the plan. And it will all do one of two things. It will either glorify him and praise his name for his mercy and his grace, or it will be the object of his condemnation, judgment, and damnation. You start talking about hell, people drop off. Not my God. Not my God. Is that the God of the Bible? Because it is. I assure you, that's the God of the Bible. Does that make him someone you don't want to worship? Not me. You know what? If I go to hell, I'd have to say I deserve it. 
You know how you really know you're getting there, growing in faith? No matter what happens at judgment, as long as he's glorified, I'll be happy. As long as everyone in all creation, even his enemies, applaud him, I'm happy with that. That's when you really start to know the Holy Spirit's taking you away from you. When Paul meets Jesus on that road to Damascus, his whole reason for living was torn down before his eyes. Paul thought life was about him reaching his full potential, which is kind of true. It is. God created us so that we could reach our full potential. But the problem is, we could be trying to reach our full potential, but aiming at the wrong thing. Paul, even though he was worshiping the right God, he was living like the pagans who didn't know God. He was living with the same mantra that 99% of all human beings do. To mine own self be true. You can worship whatever God you want. If that's the direction you're going in, you end up at a dead end. It's true. That's what James is trying to say. Wake up! Wake up! Now after seeing the risen Christ, Paul understood what success was it first time in his life. You know what he understood success to be? For me to live as Christ and if I die I gain. You know what he understood success was? If I'm going to boast in anything please Lord help me to boast in your cross. You know what? Because of that cross the whole world is crucified to me and I to it. Means he sees Christ crucified. And he says, everything else doesn't matter anymore. James is saying this. There's no way you're going to tell me belief in Jesus Christ as Messiah stops at mental assent or intellectual agreement. If you have been born again into this new way of life, you will have a faith that clings to Jesus. It will grow in the resting of all your weight upon him. It will grow in your understanding of who he is and how much he loves you. And then your life will prove your faith. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. He's saying the justification for your profession of faith will be seen in your life. That's important. Don't miss that. Let's all stand up. We're going to take communion together. This is a perfect time for us to take communion together. Let's open up to the bread. Let's take a second. Let's confess to the Lord quietly what our idols are. I could tell you what mine are. Comfort's one of my big ones. Comfort's a big idol for me. Pleasure, big idol for me. Big idol. Let's take a moment to confess. Say, Lord God, I know this is what you want from me. And I know this stands in my way. I need for you to deliver me. Don't make no promises. Don't say, I'll try harder. Don't say that. Say, I need for you to deliver me. I need for you to have mercy on me. I need for you to love me out of this. Be my strength, Lord, because I know you're my salvation. Let's take that bread and let's pray. Father God, this, this small wafer represents the perfect life of my Savior, our Savior. And when we stand here, 
we know that we're not standing because somehow we've proven ourselves to be better than anyone else on the earth. We don't come here to let the world know how great we are. We come here and we worship you because we know what you have purchased on our behalf. And then without any cost or bill or debt that we had to repay, you gave it to us. And Lord God, we thank you. We really, truly thank you for loving us this much. Let's take the bread. Let's open up that wine. It's not wine, it's grape juice. Let's just take a moment and tell him, thank you. Thank you for taking away my sin. It may have been at 7 in the morning. It may have happened at 10 minutes to 9. It may have happened at 10 last night. But this, this grape juice represents his blood, which washed over my sins that were like scarlet and made me white like snow. Thank you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this is... This is powerful, powerful stuff. Lord God, I'm sorry for the times that I have been tempted to not see it for what it was, what it is. You know, I can remember one time, Lord God, I, I really thought I did great during the week and I felt great about taking communion. As if somehow my, my good actions during the week made me more acceptable to you so that I could partake in what you earned and I don't know, man, I look back on it, Lord, and I think to myself, maybe I was at my lowest point right there. But I want to say thank you. You didn't just love me with words. You didn't just give me life and then say, I'll do everything that I need to do. Now you need to do the rest. You knew exactly who we were. You created us specifically so that you and only you could talk to us in a way that you can talk. And then you rescued us when we realized by your mercy that we couldn't swim in the ocean we were in. You are amazing and this gift is a great gift. And Lord God, we want to say thank you for it. Let's take this. And let's worship. And now bow I I stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be informed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true And if the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life Then if I join you in your sufferings Then I'll join you in you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will keep on singing My soul will be the same Oh, I won't bow idols I sing strong and worthy you. If it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice to sure that too. I won't be fooled by feelings. I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just a door.
creature, and every creature finds its inmost melody. In every human heart, its native cry. Then in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ be magnified. Come on, it's one voice. It's one voice. Come on, let's sing it out. Christ be magnified. Come on, here we go. He all you sing. Christ be man. Come on, and do it. Christ be magnified. Just set his praise arise. Christ. Come on, after all we heard, sing this, sing this over yourself. Help this to be a prayer. In all, come on, Christ. God help me. I can't do it. I need your help. of my life you please let's receive a benediction Paul says this because of this truth oh the depths of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments how inscrutable his ways for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever and ever because of this, I'm adding another one. Paul says, I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor anything else present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. You know, Lord God, I can, uh, you know, I love uh, what you put in the mouth of John. He said, even when your own conscience condemns you, the blood speaks a louder word on our behalf. We are sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb. It's because you have chose us and you have done everything necessary for us to be saved, that we are saved. When you died, you said, it is finished, paid in full for us. And nothing could take that away. Lord God, we thank you. And I pray that that truth ring in our head and our heart all week long. And it prompts us to do the things that you would be glorified in. And we pray this is one, one body in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a great day.